Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to thank and pay our respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Blue Ngo, coming to your ears from NARM, Melbourne, Australia. Let's learn together. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Sarah Booth, the show where we talk about all things happiness and the science behind it. And today I have a very special guest in the room all the way from India, and we're going to talk about the science behind happy relationships. This is a very interesting topic for me. It's kind of like very timely for me to talk about it as well. And um, without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our guest of the day. Today we have in our virtual studio, Dr. Mika Pushkana, and she is a counseling psychologist working for the last 14 years in the areas of anxiety, depression, and personality development. But I also know that uh, she does a lot of other things on the side that she did get to mention in this short bio. So uh, Dr. Mika, so nice to meet you, to see you and talk to you. And I would love for you to introduce yourself, especially a bit more about your journey and uh, how you got to do the work that you're doing and all the other kinds of specialties that you have that we f- we didn't get to mention above. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me on the show. I feel so good about it. And of course, I have a wonderful Lou with me. She made me so comfortable and blended in. So to he- he- hello to everyone who's listening to this show. I'm Dr. Mekha Pushpanna. I'm from New Delhi. I am a practicing psychologist. I have my PhD in topic like self-esteem. A uh, little bit about myself. I have been practicing for the last 14 years. My preferred uh, method of therapy is cognitive behavior therapy. And very recently, I moved into the area of family and couple. So interestingly, you, when I was working in hospitals, I realized that when a patient would come to us with a certain concern, there was a lot of baggage. There was a lot that was, you know, at home. And irrespective of whatever we did with our client in the in the hospital, in the clinic, you know, they would go back to a concern, a dynamics which could not move. And that got me thinking that why don't I explore more? There's just one part of the family I'm seeing or one part of relationship I'm seeing. Maybe would it be not nice if I move into the larger frame, which is the family? And that's where my journey into couple and family therapy took place. I have worked with heart command, that is patients who are undergoing cardiac surgeries. I've written papers on that. I've worked with kidney transplant patients and it's a very, very overwhelming experience uh, talking to their family, talking to the client, you know, talking about, you know, there's so much of discomfort more mentally than physically to go through a transplant or to, you know, offer a life altering um, surgery actually made me very grateful of who I am today. And uh, I've worked with children, I've worked with their academic performance and self-esteem that like, which is my PhD topic. And for the last three years, I've been teaching, I have been teaching undergrad and postgrad students. So the journey has been very, very fulfilling. I get up each day to work in the science of psychology. And I'm a, I love learning as much as I'm, you know, practicing. So that's, uh, I got two beautiful children and that, that they keep me grounded, uh, to talk about gratitude. I'm so glad, you know, for the simple things in life, because of the things that we see in our clinic. So yeah, that's about myself. Oh, that's such a beautiful journey and story. Uh, thank you for sharing a bit more about yourself with us. I think it's so great to hear different life stories and, you know, how people got to do the work that they're doing because it's really inspiring, you know. Um, I think a lot of the times in life we tend to forget why we're doing what we're doing or yeah. we tend to forget that there's this beautiful purpose of life um, and it's different for each 
person, uh, but we all come together. And that's that's why we, this show is so dear to my heart because we're talking about happiness, right? Um, we're, we'll, we'll dive into that in a, in a little bit as well. But before we do, uh, I would love to get to know you a bit better. I'm pretty sure the audience um, would like to do so as well. And we call this section, Have You Met Dr. Mika Pushkana? And we're going to ask for some recommendations from you. Um, first thing that comes to your mind or something that you just love so much you have to talk about. So my first question and my favorite question to ask, because I'm such a, an avid reader, is what is a book you would recommend? So I'm reading this book currently, though I have been reading it, to be honest with you, Lou, I've been reading this book for 14 years on a loop. I highly recommend this very simple read called Stop Worrying and Start Living. Uh, I have, this is by Dale Carnegie. This book has been phenomenal, A, eh, because I work with anxiety patients and I realized, interestingly, all of us have a bit of anxiety here or there. And this book is such a simpler, such a simpler in terms of what you can do to fix life. The author himself was going through a tough time in his life and he felt this is it. Everything got, you know, was done on me. And then he started changing. He started reading and he started accumulating everything that he read into this work. Of course, he's written fantastic, you know, bestsellers of, you know, how to influence people and a lot of work. But this book, I've been reading for 14 years and it's interesting. The first time I've got a book, that book got torn out and it's worn out. I've bought, I've got the new one because I like it so much. It works for me. It works for the work that I do. And this is surely a book I'm going to give to my children when they go to colleges. Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dane Carnegie. I love that so much. I was Googling it as you were talking about it because I was like, I'm sold. I'm sold. I'm, I'm, I'm getting the book. I want to read it. I need that in my life right now <laughs> and probably forever. So yeah, I love it. And you know what? The the one out copy that can go into a museum someday, you know, like the museum of your life's work or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. That's so good to hear. Thank um, you. Great. Okay. So that's about a book. Right. What about a movie? So I, uh, you know, I was, uh, because about four, four or five years back, I got into the whole idea of couple-based work. I started looking at, you know, um, of course, you know, with our Netflix and our recent movies, I, there's been a bit of undercurrent violence and I'm per se not a very violent person. So I wouldn't get attracted to maybe, the, you know, the work where there was a lot of, you know, special effects and actions, even though the fact it was a plain Jane movie. Very, very old, but a very significant Adam, Adam Sandler's movie. It's called The First 50 Days. It's yeah. a movie. It's a movie where he falls in love with a girl who has amnesia. She had an accident and she forgets her day. And how, it, you know, how he goes on a date with her till the time, you know, of course, with her condition, she cannot remember how he finds peace of how to make sure she remembers some part of him. And it's actually true, you know, when for an amnesia patient, if there is something which is done on repeat, even of the fact they have a memory loss, lose something gets established. This movie sold me out. It's so beautiful. It's something you can watch with your family. It is something that you can watch over and over again. It's so beautiful and so subtly powerful. I recommend this movie. I, I have seen it so many times. I'm a huge Adam Sandler fan. Maybe that's why I like it too. And yeah. I like his sincerity to make the relationship work than, you know, walking out. So yeah. I'm a very conventional person. I like that movie. Oh, I love that as well. Actually, me too. When I when I heard you um, talk about the movie, it's not like I haven't watched it. I have watched it. I love it. Um, but when you talk about it, and because we're going to talk about relationships today, right? I was kind of like, that is so true. It's like, it's the toughest situation and you made Don't. it work. And it's such Don't. a beautiful thing. Um, and yeah, we're going to we're gonna talk about that because the point <laughs> is to make things work, to make relationships yes. work. So we'll talk about yes. that in a little bit. Very exciting times. Uh, but we still have three more to go. So the third one is, what is a podcast you would recommend? So again, I think uh, uh, given to the science behind happy relationships, uh, while I was doing my uh, certifications in couple therapy, we did a lot of work a lot of reading on Esther Perel, who's a psychotherapist and is a very powerful name in couple-based work. So of lately, I started hearing, of course, by my couple therapist, you know, a colleague recommendation, where should we begin? 
Now, where should we begin is an amazing journey of answering simplest questions by a world-renowned therapist on what works, what does not work. If things don't work, is there a common ground? Love maps, uh, intimacy. She speaks of all of this so effortlessly, Lou. I am amazed at the amount of work she has done and how simply she narrows it down to, you know, problems which are every day. And, you know, something in couple therapy, she says very often that it's never the big problem. It was never the big problem. It's those small everyday nuisances which can break a relationship. It was never a financial loss or, you know, a, you know, death in the family or something significant. It was always those small things. Focus on the small and you can actually avert something big. So my take, and I recommend it to everybody because she speaks so well, is where should we begin by Esther Perel. Mm, I love that. Thank you so much for that recommendation. I'll definitely uh, put that on my listen list. There are so many great recommendations by our guests that I'm just, like, slowly going through them one by one. But that sounds like a great one, especially in the field of psychology and, and um, all the other things in between. I think it's a really good one. All right. Next one is who is your famous role model? Or if not a famous person, then who is your personal role model? So I um, I have a bit of music taste. I'm, I may not be the BTS or, you know, the Blackpink person because my children want to take that over from me. But I am a huge fan of Rihanna. One, I find her extremely gorgeous. I find her extremely talented. And I am so impressed that she is the first female hero of Barbados. Now, Lou, where she comes from was very tough. She managed to pull her and her family up to where she is. Uh, she has dealt with intimate partner violence so bravely. She went up and made sure she gets security and she vocalizes. And the time she vocalized, she was a celebrity. I have read through her journey because we were writing some work and I realized not only is she working on herself, she's making sure kids in her country are, all, I think probably, you know, half the education system in Barbados is managed by Rihanna. So, you know, the beauty of a person, you don't lift yourself, you lift your entire country. I mean, isn't that fantastic? Yeah, and she's, she's, You know, Barbados always had like a Barbado hero, which is patriarchally, you know, in a patriarchic sense, supposed to be a man. And here it is, the first Barbados hero, um, being a woman. I'm so proud of her. Yeah. You know, I I wish every girl stands up. I wish, I so hope every girl stands up and says, no, I will not, I will not take it down. I know yeah. it may not be possible. It's not possible. And intimate partner violence is a very, very sensitive area we globally work with. I love the fact she said, no, you cannot do this to me. And... This is, this is not fair. And she had a successful career, whereas her ex-partner is nowhere. You know, she didn't do it on him, but she made sure she doesn't take it lying low. And I couldn't be more proud. Yeah, so. I, just, I just love how passionate you, how passionately you talked about her. And yeah, we, we love our Queen Riri. You know, she's yes. amazing, really inspiring. And I actually learned a, a few new things about her. I, I, I know about her and what happened with her previous partner, because I think that's, that's something that everyone knows about. Everyone um, knows. Yeah, yes. it, it's it's so true what you just said. It's beautifully captured. And yeah, the fact that she's like a our female hero, um, true hero on planet Earth is just super inspiring. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. Uh, what a beautiful story. Well, I'm just taking a few moments to, to <laughs> let it sink in. Uh, <laughs> but the last question in this part is uh, one about learning. So we've talked a lot about the fun side of things. What, how about a course? What is a course you've completed that you would like to talk about? So uh, Tata Institute of Social Science is a, is a, um, is a college or a university in India, which is uh, apparently considered one of the finest in the country. The selection process to, you know, to be there is again, something like a dream come true. And uh, where, since I have been 19, I have been, you know, that has been on my list to be at Tata Institute of Social Science, which is called this in Mumbai, in India. And um, 
uh, I wanted to always be there. Some things happen in, you know, through the thing and I couldn't leave my city. And I told myself, I want to be there. And the the admission process and the selection process is very, very tough. But um, I wanted to do it. And I just recently completed my work uh, certifications and my diploma and my license to practice as a family and a couple therapist. And I feel not only so good, I feel so proud about myself. And I feel that, you know, when you, when you study in a place, you always dreamt and you be with the people who are so fabulous and you're learning from all your, you know, classmates. Uh, it feels so good. I think I'm more confident of what I do. I can, you know, I can be more responsible in case I make some errors as a therapist because where I studied from. So I completed the course in couple and family-based therapy uh, from Tata Institute of Social Science, Mumbai. And I feel very good about myself. So Aww. yeah, that's the that's wonderful. So lovely to hear that. I love to hear uh, about people learning things and just really enjoying it because education is super important, um, at least to me. And I think it's something that we should um, talk about more often, you know, like uh, talking about a course that we like or even getting into new courses all the time. That's super fun. Yes. Yeah. Yes, it is. So now we've covered the first part and we've got to know you a bit better. I feel like uh, I feel like we're pals now that I know a little bit more about you. Um, so I hope you're feeling a bit more comfortable, especially this is oh, yes. the first time you're on a podcast. Um, so we're going to have a lot of fun because now we're going to talk about the science behind happy relationships. And since the show is about happiness, let's talk about happiness. First of all, um, this is the question that all of our guests get asked. And mind you, each person has a very different answer. So well, I wonder to you, Dr. Mika, what does happiness mean? What is happiness to you? Um, it's, it's, it's actually a beautiful question. We ask this a lot in our therapy and I'm so glad, you know, you, you got this question. Um, I, I absolutely second what you said, Lou, happiness is so subjective. Of course, uh, we all look happy, but our reasons could be very, very different. If I had to speak for myself, I feel happiness to me is a sense of well-being. Now, if I say what is well-being to me, it's maybe to me a feeling of fulfillment, you know? things I could have accomplished in a day. You know, it could actually just be plain household chores and an exercise routine. But to me, happiness is something that I create every day. It is not something which is uh, permanent. It is more state of mind for me. Uh, when I am able to achieve what I thought for the day, maybe things I cannot change. You know, I'm, I'm 41 and I realize maybe in my 30s, I was so fixated on changing things, which on the hindsight, I feel I could not change because there were people outside my system and there was it was the environment. Today, you know, maybe maturity and age, I feel happiness is things that I can control and I can change. It's me than expecting someone else. In my head, I think it's a, it's trying to find a balance of emotions. It's somewhere trying to find what is ha going well in life right now and if things are not going well maybe find patience for it which i did not clearly have when i was in my 30s or in my 20s oh wow um i'm so glad that you shared a bit more about your experience in your 20s and 30s you know i'm in my 20s and i'm like i need to figure everything out right now and then i'm like no 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 it's fine. You're going to keep learning. You're going to figure things out even more. And uh, your definition of happiness will change. And I, I just love that you said, uh, focus on what you can control. Like it, it is what you can control. And I think, uh, again, this is a different definition that we have not had on this show. It's very personal to you. And I love that. Um, I've realized recently that, uh, and, and over the past few years, that it's it doesn't matter what happens externally because you cannot control things that happen well, to you or happen around you, but you can control how you react to them. And that's right. um, there's a new concept that I've been embracing. And this is probably, you know, closer to your uh, definition of happiness is radical acceptance. You know, whatever happens, I accept it. And um, wow. it's just, you know, it's, it just matters how I react to whatever Good. it is that happens. Um, because in the past, I used to have this like urge to, control everything. Um, probably just like what you just shared about your earlier experiences. And 
I realized I was holding on too tightly that I was, you know, causing myself a lot of anxiety. And because, you know, this is one of your areas of expertise, I thought we could we could touch on that. Um, but then, you know, once I let go of that and I was like, you know what, I, I can't really control that. I can only plan for what I know right now. Um, and this is because over the past few years, I've worked on the biggest project of my life, I would call it, um, <laughs> you know, like um, I moved my whole life to another country. And I think it's so... Wow it's so anxiety inducing and I, I don't really know what was going to happen. And I was like, you know, like I'm just grasping on to all of this and causing myself so much mental health issues. But then, but you know, like up to a certain point, I was like, you know what? It's okay. Scenario A, it happens. Scenario B, it doesn't happen, but I have plans for both scenarios. It'll be great. But at the same time, though, at such a young age, you've taken such a big, brave decision. It's Thank not you. comparing to individuals, but uh, I don't think I ever had the courage in my 20s, neither in my 30s. I don't know if I have it in my 40s to move a country, move from known to unknown is the biggest. Um, I, I don't know if I can do it. I'll not speak for anyone else, but you yeah. look, you did it. Thank and you're you. acclimat acclimatizing to something new. You want to be, you want to blend in because because you want to have your own life in a new country. Yeah. So yeah. more power to you. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It, it takes a lot of courage. It takes a lot of pain. And it takes yeah. a lot of, you know, work on myself as well. Because as I said, I learned so much th through the process. It was not that I was great. You know, throughout the process, there was obviously a lot of anxiety and then there was the need to, to be in control of everything. And I was making myself miserable. And since we're talking about happiness, I just really want to emphasize what you just talked about, you know, like the need to control everything and what you can actually control. And I think Very that's such new. a nice thing to talk about because I feel like a lot of people might go through similar things or um, they might go through similar feelings, you know, like to, to make sure everything is under control or to have a sense of control. And in fact, I was actually talking to one of my best friends and she was saying that I want to be in control of everything. Yeah, yeah. Um, it I was think... like a, it was an activity we were doing. I don't remember what the question was about, but she said that. And I was like, huh, that's interesting. You, you don't seem like that. Yeah. And I don't know. Uh, so, you know, when we have patients, for example, coming to us for work because, you know, there's been an ex absolute mental or a nervous breakdown, uh, you know, a project that ran dry or, you know, something in terms of, you know, getting to know your partner is cheating on you or, uh, you know, children start to get into drugs or premarital relationships, you know, at times for people who would want to, I, I do feel bad for them because how difficult it is you can't sleep thinking you want to be on top of everything because you don't want to be cat you know caught surprised or you don't you don't want to be you don't want your fears to come alive but the trouble is for you and me and for everyone else there are things much more that are out of our control and we continue to worry and feel miserable even make ourselves sick of what we can't control yeah. and at the same time living a life, taking granted for things we can control. And, you know, for example, in therapy, when we tell people that, you know, okay, you can get up in the morning, you can take a bath and make your breakfast. And, you know, my clients will say that is so normal. What, where is the power there? What is, where is the happiness to make yourself a bread and butter and a cup of coffee? But, you know, in depression, or people who go through episodes of sadness, very, very difficult phase, you know, for them, you, this is the biggest success. They come to our clinic, four sessions, and they tell us, you know what, Ashley took a bath. Imagine. So when you see this quantum of how you define happiness for someone who wants to keep achieving, which is not bad, ambition is great. And for someone who's post a trauma is coming around and says, you know, I took a bath after seven days. You know, I feel there's more power to a person who can control how he starts his day, vis a vis yeah. done after things, which is good. Of course, ambition is good. I'm ambitious and I love to be ambitious, but there are things I may not be able to control over and yeah. above my ambition. Yeah. So, absolutely. So. Yeah. That's such a great reminder in life, isn't it? Because it, 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 a lot of the times we take things for granted. And um, I think that's one of the misconceptions that I've noticed about happiness. You're just taking things for granted and be like, 
this is easy, you know, like, why aren't you doing this? And in fact, it's actually hard for some people sometimes to get out of bed, like you said, or even take a bath. And once Mm. once they've done that, it's so much power to them and and so much of that level of happiness, um, even if it seems so small, um, it it actually shows a lot because, you know, I've been through depression myself and I know what it looks like and feels like. So I think it's interesting when you just assume that, you know what, they just took a bath. What's the big deal? But actually, Better. no, I think the little things really matter. And for for someone who goes through a lot to be able to do one small thing, it's so much more than, you know, you doing your regular day to day activity or even achieving something um, exciting, even sometimes in comparison, it's, it's really unfair, I know, but um, I think it's important to notice that. So that's one of the misconceptions because I'm trying to segue into misconceptions now. Um, So I'm sure you've worked with a lot of people and feel free to share your thoughts on what I just uh, talked about as well. But you've worked with a lot of uh, people, couples, um, and like you said, even children. So you must have had multiple conversations that touch on aspects of happiness and you must have seen dozens if not like hundreds of kinds of misconceptions when it comes to happiness. Uh, So what do you think to be some of the biggest misconceptions that people have when it comes to happiness? Uh, I'll start with myself. I'm the first in line who had a lot of misconceptions about happiness. Uh, And you, we all, the world over generally went through this very tough phase called pandemic. We all were home and, uh, you know, initially first two months were so nice. Everybody was working from home. We had our family around and then suddenly, you know, people started getting irritated because their freedom, their life was taken away. All of us were so glad, maybe first 10 days, 20 days. I was happy for about two months because, you know, I was looking after my children and my family and I thought, oh, I'm so glad. But slowly I started to first time in my life, get a lot of time with my family and myself. You know, otherwise I would be driving to work. I would go out for my run. And now I'm sitting at home. I realized I started to feel unhappy when I was the safest in the home I have created. And that's when I thought about what happiness is to me. So maybe where I went wrong and what I commonly see in my work is happiness is not everlasting glue. It's not fixed. It's not permanent. It is something we have to create every day. It has to be, it has to be seeked. It has to be created. Number two, I feel happiness is a state of mind, or not only a state of mind, but it is an act of creation. If I feel maybe running makes me happy, I need to get out and do it. If I feel more money would make me happy, I have to create that money. Happiness is not only something that I'm thinking. Happiness, according to me, is also something that needs to be done. People come to a therapist wanting to have a peaceful mind. But the thought cannot make you peaceful if there is no act on it. So I feel A, happiness is not everlasting. B, it is not only a state of mind. There has to be an action to create something. Thirdly, I feel happiness, uh, you know, has a very fine balance. I know everything that is a happy thought cannot be created. But it is something that if I think of happiness, and I physically see it, I can measure it. It is something that I can achieve. It make, it gives me a feedback that my happy thought was validated. So happiness is not only something that is in my thought and I step out. For example, if I want to lose weight and I want to build muscles and I want to feel fit in my 40, I want to feel good when I see myself as a state of mind. I go out for running is an act. And when I see maybe losing some, you know, uh, I I lose some weight or my, you know, my skin looks better. That's also something that I can measure. And that gives me a feedback to my thoughts that this thought was valid and it was put to action and the results have been seen. Happiness is something that has to be created. Fourth, happiness is something like uh, something that you very nicely said is internal as well as external. I cannot think happy and not feel happy when I see something. So when I go f- go out for a run and I start seeing, you know, my uh, my clothes start fitting me and uh, my silhouette looks better, it is also a lot to do with how I'm feeling of that feedback. So it's a combination of my internal thought of running 
and seeing the change and feeling good about it. It's a beautiful combination, like a loop of internal and external. It cannot only be that I want to lose weight, I want to be happy in my relationship, and I'm not going to do anything about it. It doesn't happen like that. Fifth, happiness needs need not always be a big event. Um, success, happiness, joy, freedom, gratitude are hidden in our very daily lives. You know, those small strokes of success. Uh, if I give up on having Coke or, you know, ice cream or chocolates, if I only maybe being, you know, have a cheat day on a weekend than weekends, if I do not eat anything after 8 p.m., if once in a week I go on intermittent fasting, if I'm actually nice to my partner, these small strokes of success make happiness than one huge event, like maybe, you know, losing in a month, losing 10, 12 kilos. I know I'm talking a lot about losing weight right now, but just <laughs> giving you just giving an example about how happiness looks. And very, very crucial. Last point. Everyone does not have the same sense of happiness. At times, I see the, you know, partner, people coming in relationships, you know, who are in committed relationships, like marriages or long-time living relationships. And they say that, you know, I'm doing so well and he's not happy. I look after her and she's not happy. I have grown to believe with my experience, Lou, that people have a different radar of what happiness is. In an intimate relationship, we just need to identify maybe my sense of happiness may not be his or her sense of happiness. Yeah, so yeah, these are absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so many of them, right? I so think many. it's it, that's what makes life so interesting and and complex at the same time. You know, there's so much to navigate, and when it comes to happiness, everyone's kind of like, oh yeah, like happiness is good, it's yeah, a good yeah. thing. But how do you approach it? And do you even see it right? Like, I don't think so. We all have our own misconceptions and we probably notice uh, misconceptions in others. Um, and I think it's a lifelong process of exploring what we might be getting wrong at that particular moment because our lives changes. Uh, and when life changes, you just, you just have new things in your mind. And you're like, oh, this will make me happy, but maybe not. It's an, a constant evolution of happiness, I would say. And like, you know, I, I hear very often, you know, as a complaint where someone says, oh, you know, she doesn't, you know, he doesn't buy me gifts. He doesn't take me out for a vacation. He doesn't do the expense. He doesn't do the date nights. And it's interesting to see when that happens, example, when that action actually comes in, were you happy? And it's not always that some couples do come back and say, oh, he did it, but he did it half-heartedly. But he still did it. You wanted him to do something and he did it. But no, it was half-hearted. He wasn't paying me attention. So what made you happy? What would make you happy? His undivided attention. So naturally, I would come across and say that, is it the attention or is it the vacation? And you know, it was actually the need for affection than, you know, have frivolous gifts which were put aside and snubbed and the partner may not even do it again because... You know, he receives such a negative feedback that, oh, yeah, this is not good enough. So happiness is on is very different on everybody's radar. And maybe, you know, Lewis, at times, very, very small things that can make people happy. So a sense of communication has to be there. Um, undivided attention has to be there to understand maybe you and I may not think the same of a concept like happiness, but because we are in a relationship with our partners, our idea of happiness needs to be shared with that partner so that they know what it is for him to make me happy. That's yeah. my Yeah. Totally. And you just touched on our topic of today. So let's talk about the topic, which is happy relationships. You know, we covered a lot of misconceptions when it comes to happiness in life in general. Um, and uh, we know that relationships, especially ro romantic relationships, play such a big part in our lives and our Very happiness. Nice. It's not everything. And Very that's what nice. I've learned as well. You know, a, a happy relationship doesn't make your life happy in general, Very if uh, other aspects don't go well. Uh, but 
it's super important to understand, to navigate relation, romantic relationships in the right way. And you already addressed some of the misconceptions when it comes to, you know, the, the happiness in the relationships. So oh, the next question would be, how can couples overcome them? Um, okay, something, again, I thought um, very recently over the weekend, I had a lot of, you know, couples and there was a lot of thinking, I knew I'm going to come for this podcast, so I would keep making notes. Um, I have couples coming and telling me that we fight a lot and we do not want to fight. And it gets me thinking of what is so wrong about having disagreements. So a myth or a misconception about a happy relationship is not to fight. I feel we all are individually different. No two people could think alike and we need to accept that. So number one, it's okay to have disagreements but learn to figure out how to patch it. It should not be the end game. We fight, I mean, we fight with our siblings, we fight with our parents, we fight with our best friends, but we somehow patch it. What goes wrong with couples is where there's a lot of anger that comes in because one, they both have disagreed with each other. So the biggest misconception about a happy relationship is not to fight. Number two would be wanting to constantly please each other, you know, where it becomes at one point in time exhausting and and you don't want to do it anymore. And hence, maybe, you know, partners start to, you know, uh, get addicted to a phone or game or work because they're tired to constantly please each other. Yes, in the initial phase of relationships, everybody pleases because that's the start to the relationship and also because you want to make it happen. You want to put your best foot forward. And that's absolutely okay. What is not okay is the pressure to constantly please each other because eventually you tire out and you cannot be your true self. Um, third is uh, being silent is better than an argument. I get this a lot. Uh, I have noticed, Lou, that when you know, because you love your partner or you know that it may not be, the confrontation may not be taken very well. People go quiet and they sulk and they get passive aggressive. And a relationship gets hurt more when nothing is said at all. Passive aggression bottles up so much that one fine day, it's just a uh, let loose and every everything comes out which has been, you know, which has been bottled up for so long. And hence, there is more damage that one can do than regular outlets. So I feel one can speak up, but with respect. And um, intimacy, um, uh, you know, of course, I've heard a misconception is not important. We are together. Intimacy is the backbone of a relationship. Where words don't speak, body language works. Intimacy bonds the relationship deeper. And it's very important to be mindful of each other's needs. These are physical needs which are attached to emotional fulfillment. And a um, bigger misconception is that if I don't make her feel good about herself, it's okay, but we're still together. In a relationship, in a romantic relationship, Lou, I feel intimacy is vital. It needs to be worked on. Seek help, go we'll meet people, because if this aspect is not fulfilling, the discomfort of lack of, you know, fulfillment in intimacy comes down in a lot of other quarters. So intimacy is a very big misconception. It needs to be nurtured very well. One has to be mindful of their partner's needs. Uh, there's, you know, another misconception where, you know, I have gone through the part in my life and my partner is there to heal me. Uh, our partners are not there as a recovery. Our partners are there for our company, companionship, long-term, family. If they're not there to heal us. They're not. There is a concept called us. I feel as partners, we tend to put a lot of pressure on the other partner to, you know, get me through a bad mood or get me through a discomfort or get me through sickness. They are partnered with us. We have to look beyond um, us. We have to look beyond ourselves, to look into that us. Maybe there's a lot of pressure on a partner to heal the other partner. Maybe, you know, the other partner is absolutely unheard in the relationship 
because there's so much of pressure in keeping a partner packed in a you know in a bubble wrap a partnership or intimate relationships or romantic relationships is us it is never me before you um next misconception would be uh, to have a happily ever after you know all our fairy tales give us this prince coming along you know getting us through our misery of life and having us the happily after which lu at times gets shattered when we get married and oh you know we live in a relationship that where is that spark where is that intimacy where is that magic um with age with my profession i have realized we are ourselves happily ever after we need to give ourselves that if we continue socially comparing ourselves with you know oh my sister has a better life with her husband or my friend you know social media my god just makes it worse we start to feel sorry for ourselves and not even see something that we have so maybe we all actually have a happily ever after but we refuse to see it because we continue to put that spark in someone else so you, i think somewhere it's very important to tell yourself a that you have it and in case you don't feel that you have a happily ever after work on it together but first work on yourself as well um another misconception reading each other's minds partnership cannot be assumed multitasking is not easy uh one has to work one has to look after children uh maybe reading each other's minds just because you've been together for 20 years does not make sense i feel it's very important to speak and clarify than assume he or she would know what i want um trust trust and trust there is no happiness uh in being dishonest uh i don't think any lie can make a relationship strong staying honest is very very important the biggest misconception is if i have if i have secrets of course before her or the relationship i think uh lies do come around uh if you lie one has to like keep lying more what is a misconception is um you don't have to tell the truth i feel the misconception needs to be broken down if one can trust and stay honest a lot of misery is taken away from the relationship um um second last uh, misconception is children build a happy relationship children or significant others make happy people it takes two to make a happy relationship uh don't triangulate it a relationship is bidirectional it's not something which can okay of course when a child comes both the partners tend to focus on the child but it's always you it's always you a pet another significant person in the family or a child cannot make a happy relationship in fact people assume that if they're not getting along they should have a child maybe things would get better it's huge misconception a relationship is built on two people and the way they trust each other and uh, lastly people feel happy relationships once married is done and dusted i feel to stay in love you have to constantly work on the relationship so yeah these are some of the misconceptions i had written down in a prompt wow so many of them and you know it's just uh, yes. so many things to think about to keep in mind and to work on you know it's it's not so simple because i think um i don't know about others but to me it's it's like once you're in a relationship the work never stops just like what you were saying it's not about just marriage but it's just like you know any phase of the relationship the work never stops because once you stop that's kind of a clear sign that you're kind of letting go or you're not really putting in the effort and that might actually damage the relationship and this to me applies to all kinds of relationships not just yes. romantic relationships yes and the trouble here is what happens is because we want to constantly please each other yeah. we constantly you know we, we raise the bar and the partner may never say it out of the fear of not having a confrontation you know the relationship starts to get heavy it's like you're holding a load and something someone is adding on to it one day you will get angry and you will throw it and say i can't take it anymore or you'll put that load somewhere and say i'm tired this is exactly what happens in relationships all of us all of us put a lot of 
pressure or load of expectations, our expectations on our partners. And there's never a feedback because there's a constant need to please, because there's a fear of confrontation or what if they go. But that's not how relationships work, you know. It will, the patience or the endurance will break one day and you'll be like, I can't take this. So in a in a relationship, trust, honesty and respect, they go a long way. If a relationship, uh, you know, if you do things every day without even thinking it's a chore to do, I think you're doing a good job. It's very, very heartbreaking to see people making that effort because they have to, not because they want to. Yeah, that hits hard. You know, yeah, that, that that probably hits some people really hard. <laughs> I don't know who, but yeah, I, I've seen that quite a bit. So I totally agree with you. And I think one of the things that you mentioned in, in those uh, misconceptions that really stood out to me is communication. Because, you know, whatever it is that you're working on or whatever the issues, um, you have to have that level of communication in yeah. the relationships. Because I think, uh, I, I don't know about the statistics, but I feel like when I've talked to my friends about their different relationships, it's, it's obviously there are multiple reasons why relationships don't work out. But I would say nine times out of 10, it's because of communications. Yeah, and right. um, so it's such an important thing for partners or, or people, couples to keep in mind when it comes to a relationship, you know, to have really effective um, communication. So I wonder, what do you think of the role of communication in, in a relationship? Because it's not just about the building part, but it's also the sustaining part of it, right? As you said earlier, yes. the, the work doesn't yes. stop. So mm -hmm. what is what is the role of communication and how can we actually foster effective communication in romantic relationships? Um, it always takes two people to talk, like you and I are talking. We both have our own airspace. You talk, I listen, I listen, you talk. It's as normal as that. Uh, it happens with everybody. Somehow in romantic relationships, the dynamics of communications change or there is a bit of a problem because of a lot of emotions which have been invested into. What I see, I, what I commonly see when I'm looking at communication styles and patterns of people, uh, communication cannot be perfect all the time, no. You know, people at times have different communication needs and styles. Somebody would only understand um, when they have been told to at times, some people have to raise their volume and get angry for their partners to listen. How can communication be put in a manner which is uh, which does not hurt the other person? I have a couple of uh, suggestions. Uh, one would be to to keep some time aside to talk without any distraction. It could be phones, it could be meetings, it could be laptops, it could be anything. You know, driving, maybe people talk at times when they're driving and they're looking at the traffic while they're talking, I recommend to not get into the loop of miscommunication. Try talking without a distraction, number one. Number two, talk about what is happening, then bringing, out the, bringing in the past and how it's impacting you. I feel I and we statements are so very powerful than you. You know, you statements somehow make people get defensive. So if I had to speak something to my husband and I talk about I and we, I am A, taking the responsibility of my feelings. B, I am talking about how important this relationship to me is when we see it as a we, then talking as a you statement. Uh, it's very tough at times when we are triggered, but most of us, including myself, would listen to respond. We don't listen to listen. And that is a very, very big problem. And that naturally comes from past experiences that all of us would want to listen to a discussion or an argument because you want to respond. We're not listening in the first place. I'm working on it, Lou, very, very honest. I tell myself every day, I want to listen to my husband because he may have a point of view. Uh, at times when I'm angry, it may not work, but listen to your partner as a me than as an I and you. Uh, sharing positive feelings with your partner is a very, it neutralizes, you know, situations where which are tough. For example, 
you know, when you appreciate genuine appreciation and when you admire them, uh, or basically you make them feel important, it's a major soother when people have a miscommunication going on. Game changer for any miscommunication, Lou, would be the tone. The tone of our voice is the deal breaker to create or to resolve a miscommunication. Tone can be checked. It yeah. may not. So half the time, someone else is telling us to check our tone. I feel we listen to respond, but if we can listen to ourselves and, you know, check on ourselves, it, it's literally the game changer. Um, I have told this to myself over the years. I've been married for 17 years and uh, we worked on our relationship from the beginning. I feel now I realize that I don't have to be right all the time. I initially had this urgency to be right all the time because I felt maybe, you know, I knew things better because of my own perception of things. Maybe today when, you know, me and my husband talk, I feel I don't have to be right all the time. And it is such a relief to not be right all the time. It is such a load off. I think I pay attention and I listen to him because I also tell myself I don't have to be right all the time. Yeah. I may be, but I don't have to be. <laughs> um, uh, next, of course, uh, miscommunication is uh, seen a lot by the posture, the tone, the expression. All of them convey a message. Uh, it, you know, if our non-verbals are clearly communicating that our partners are not heard or believed, they'll be more misfiring. So, yes, um, how we can reduce the miscommunication would be to sit absolutely facing the other person than sideways. That looks like a threat. Uh, using more of I and V than you. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, taking the load off of not wanting to be right all the time and to be prepared that if you are genuinely getting triggered, like you're out there to, you know, just have a full-blown episode of anger, walk out. People actually manage or control the damage more when they walk out because it was not really about them. It was how you were feeling when you were angry. It may be better. It is absolutely advisable. You know, when people have, for example, stomach issues, they've been told not to eat anything from outside and avoid junk food or avoid maybe hard drinks. It's actually recommended to walk away, calm down, and then engage and address the issue than dealing with it when we are angry. None of us have ever won anything when we were angry. None of us. It's true. Yeah, so true. I've seen this a lot and I actually have experienced it myself. I, I heard something and I was like, okay, the way that I understand it is making me really angry right now, but I don't want to get into an argument now. So I think it's better to take a step back, process it, and then talk about it. And then when I thought about the situation, I was kind of like, you know what? Maybe I was overreacting a little bit, but there's still a part of it that I want to clarify. Otherwise, um, this won't work. And, you know, I, I addressed that later on. And I think that really helped um, in a relationship. But I think the, the part where you mentioned, you know, the communications and uh, what really works and what, what really helps um, just got me to think about the different things that we need to communicate. You know, it's, it's not just about how we communicate, but what do we need to communicate in a relationship, right? Because there's so much uh, to cover. Like we talked about earlier, you know, like uh, our needs are different. Uh, the way we see happiness is different. Our Very. values are different. These are the things that are so crucial when it comes to a, a relationship. And especially ro in romantic relationships, the pitfall is when you don't really communicate about um, the big things, like what yes. it is that matters. And one of the biggest things that I have found recently to really matter in, in a relationship is attachment styles. And as I said to you, when we just started uh, talking about this podcast episode, you know, I, I started to talk about it a lot with my friends and um, it's come up uh, a lot at work as well. You know, we're doing a lot of research in, into this area so we can develop a good course about it. So since we have you here and you've worked with a lot of couples, how do different attachment styles affect relationships? I know it's a very big topic. There's a whole yeah. book on it. So I, I highly doubt that we could cover everything with one simple question, but um, 
since you've worked with a lot of couples and you do a lot of um, reading and research into this, I'm sure you can probably help us to narrow it down into, you know, the key areas that we should know about when it comes to attachment styles. And so glad, you know, you brought out, you know, the whole attachment style concept, because yes, the entire relationship sits on how we are attached to the relationship in the first place. Um, and I'm so, yes, actually, you're absolutely right. There's a whole book, literally a whole book on attachment styles, but I'll keep it very, very simple with some examples to, you know, to inform the audience and just to get my own clarity about attachment styles. So in psychology, we've got four attachment styles. It's always preferred to have a secure attachment style, which is basically where you can trust people, you know your emotions, you can express your discomfort directly without hurting someone. You can be cooperative and you can be flexible in a relationship. That's the secure attachment style which everybody wants. Then there is something like an anxious attachment style which so interestingly you, all of us, all of us are on different, so there are four attachment styles, all of us with certain relationships could be secure, could be anxious, could be avoidant dismissive or could be avoidant and fearful. So all of us don't only stick on to one style, we could, we could, you know, move depending on the relationship and the situation also. So secure is what everybody wants, the ideal way. Second is the anxious one where we are very nervous, we look, feel, show in our system that we are nervous. We struggle to communicate very, very directly, you know, because we are scared and that comes as an acting out behavior, you know, because we are so anxious, we are unable to communicate directly. It comes out like an acting out behavior where, you know, you would make your partner generous or you would uh, smoke a little more in public when you're not doing that in private. People would, uh, you know, flirt with someone just to, you know, get back onto their partner. The acting out behavior where, you know, if you're doing this, let me show you what I can do. That comes from the anxious attachment styles. Third would be the avoidant dismissive, which basically completely disregards and downplays the importance of the relationship, you know, maybe not introducing to you the friends. Uh, nowadays, it's very important to put it on social media, so not updating it on social media. There are no pictures of your relationship, you know, you together. So people don't even know if you're existing, you know, so the avoidant dismissive. And one partner may feel that, you know, we're going so strong. Why are you not, you know, putting us out there as a couple? And the other one may say it's, you know, it's not important. What's important is us, but their partner does not feel so. Um, is usually um, very, very self-reliant. Avoidant dismissive would be very self-reliant and not being a partner to the other person. Uh, Avoiding dismissive partners can become very vulnerable when there's a big crisis, but usually keep to themselves. And at times their partners may feel that they're actually having a relationship only with themselves because the partner who's downplaying the relationship is not even there. So that is avoidant dismissive. And the last would be avoidant and fearful. Uh, they're more dependent. They're more clingy onto the relationship. They do not understand personal space. People who would be avoiding fearful or would have that attachment style, uh, fear, hate, dread, rejection. And because that fear is so powerful to, uh, they have a lot of, they instill a lot of anxiety in relationships, you know, making a lot of phone calls, texting, uh, stalking their partners, because some way they have a very low Self opinion about themselves, and they fear that if I don't control this relationship, this relationship will go away from me. All of us want to be secure. At times, our situations make us move from anxious, avoidant dismissive to avoiding fearful. What can be done? I mean, of course, it's a very, very, very big, crucial concept about um, relationship but for the purpose of keeping to the time I only think of one thing which is learning to set boundaries it is so important 
to have boundaries. Uh, boundaries may be the rules that you set for yourself, your body, your mind space, and your belongings. So I made some examples here, you know, maybe like not letting your partner manipulate you. Tell them to talk, then accuse. Not using manipulation yourself to win an argument. If you do not want to be manipulated, you cannot manipulate the other person. Mm -hmm. Saying no to sex when you don't want to, than being an ever pleaser. That's actually setting a clear set boundary. Not using sex as a tool of power in a relationship. If you can say no, you cannot use sex as a weapon to find control. Trying to find your time when you both are together also. That means even the fact you're together, you can negotiate a time which is yours and a time which is for the both of you. Find what is mutual and exclusive in the relationship. Talk about what is mutual, that is your and mine shared, and what is exclusive, which is mine only. If you open up that sort of space to communicate, your partner would know that this is a boundary that is set around me. Maybe about 15-20 years back, a psychotherapist felt making or setting a boundary was not was not needed. It's like a red flag in the relationship. I feel you today, you know, we all have grown out of that space where we give everything to the relationship and be left behind. I feel currently when I see, read, uh, partners are becoming more financially independent. There is a concept of marriage, but it's a very, very, you know, different concept of marriage. Solo trips, you know, the idea of relationships are changing. It's dynamic. Hence, according to me, setting clear set boundaries help you stay in the relationship than fall apart. And very, very important is... Uh, absolute non-acceptance to abuse. If the boundary is not set in the first place, manipulation just comes in and abuse is the third step to manipulation. So abuse is not acceptable, not on the first date, not in the first year of marriage. Abuse is not acceptable. It could be verbal, it could be physical, it could be sexual, it could be emotional. No abuse ever is acceptable. Yeah, not at any point in the relationship, for sure. That's for sure. I think it's a really tough one to think about and even talk about for some people. But I think noticing early signs really help because you need to, you really need to set that boundary, right? So going back to boundary setting. It's just like, this is unacceptable. It's not even once, not even twice. Because I actually had a, uh, a friend who uh, went through this a, a long time ago. She told me um, that she needed a place to crash. And uh, I was asking her why, because, you know, she was actually living with her partner at the time. And she said, he hit me. And and I said, of course, you know, my door's open, come, um, it's okay. But after that, she went back to him. And in my head, uh, I already knew that it wasn't going to work. And I, I started looking at her partner very differently because we hang out a lot. Um, so I started looking at this person very differently and uh, he does show her a lot of affection and he does do things that she wants him to do. But that part of the relationship was unacceptable to me. Um, however, as a friend, it wasn't my place to, you know, say anything or decide anything for her. I was just constantly checking up on her and I was just asking, like, so how are you going with him? You know, has he stopped being physical like that? And um, for a while, um, you know, it, it really stopped. Uh, but eventually yeah. the relationship didn't work out. And I think that, you know, that sh should have been a really clear sign for her to think about the relationship in the first place. Um, because she, spe you know, she tried to make it work again and spend so much more time with him, but eventually it didn't. And I think all of that started with with this uh, little act. I, I might be wrong um, because I don't know everything about their relationship in and out. But that to me was a clear red flag that, you know, if has she set the boundary really clearly from from the beginning or from that moment onwards to herself, um, she could have actually saved herself a lot of time to actually work on herself or, you know, had her peace back. So that's the way that I would see it. And actually recover from that hurt. You know, I yeah. uh, 
I've I've worked with uh, a very sensitive area like child sexual abuse, you and very young kids, and you know they don't even know what happened to them, but they know something dirty happened to them. And my working in this area, you know, when you know with teenagers, of course, it's very very different. With children, it's very very different. They're shocked because it's happening maybe from someone in the family, mostly from someone they know, not from the outsiders. I picked up some cues of. how do we talk about sex education on how do we talk women per se maybe they're more culturally bound to make things happen because there's a lot of responsibility on a woman to make a relationship last hence maybe a pitfall of once in a while being hit or slapped or being said something demeaning could feel like one off is that one off experience is not uh shown the door or given a clear header um it will happen again abuse always abuser always strikes back because they're also by the way scared when they do it for the first time when they realize they didn't get a reaction they do it again no relationship survives on abuse it is so sad when i say this that even in the fact we are sitting in 2023 there are equal amount of women of your and my age who get abused who could be as qualified as you and me because they want to make it work what will the family say you know you got children who oh, are financially dependent on him if the abuse is not stopped it will never ever stop and there is no relationship when you're only scared and pleasing the other person so here the thing is you know the person who is abusing wants to constantly be be pleased and they immediately go on a pedestrian that if you do not please me i will do something to hurt you i don't know if that relationship so there is a relationship but i don't even know if it is a relationship so it's a very very tough place to navigate it's because it's very culturally in tuned as well to yeah. women to keep the relationship going or if there's infidelity in the relationship it's always a woman to be blamed that you know maybe he was not happy enough maybe you should do things differently and she's miserable you know she has to jump leaps and bounds to make it work when it was actually the two of them together yeah so absolutely it's it's a really hard space to navigate and you know i guess um happy relationships take a lot of work and and setting that boundaries and, and knowing ourselves from the very beginning would help us from a lot of troubles you know it, it's it's kind it's sad as it might sound cuz you know romantic relationships you're supposed <laughs> to think about it from like a a feeling perspective but i think it, the the older i got i i just realized how much of your head you actually need to use when it comes to yes. romantic relationships yes of course you have to have feelings but you also need to be really clear about your boundaries your attachment styles uh your communication styles your values you know um where you want to go together or you know as as people because you don't want to lose sight of who you are i think that's also one of the biggest thing um because as you said a lot of women just want to make it work at and at the expense of her own self because you know yes. if your if your value tells you that you don't want to be in a, an abusive relationship ever however you needed to make this relationship work and you tolerate that you're going against your own self and right. that is so sad just so so it sad is- It is sad. It's hurtful, and uh, you know. Um, so I have, so I have had friends who would, you know, name call each other because they have a certain structure. You know, now uh, there's a lot of ridicule on women <clears throat> who would be plus size because of the way they are, right? And maybe a plus size man would not be ridiculed as much, maybe as much as a woman would do. There's a lot of, you know, media and a lot of culture that comes in through. In a relationship, I've seen plus size women so confident look when their husband or partner accepts the way they are, that they can keep a strong face when they are bullied or harassed otherwise. Whereas the most confident, gorgeous women feel so underconfident in their relationship, it's because of lack of respect their partner gives them. So, irrespective of the outside world, will tell you. if your intimate relationship does not give you the respect and the trust it's very difficult so we may want to look outside but it may not be ever enough so if there's a lot of investment in a romantic relationship 
somewhere the boundary needs to be set. Yeah. We have we have evolved. Absolutely. I, again, I, I think this topic is such a big topic and we might not get to cover all of the questions that we initially wanted to cover. I think we good. did cover a lot of, of good ideas here already. Uh, but I think the, the last question is uh, probably the most important one because we've talked a lot about the different areas that need to be um, thought about when you're in a romantic relationship. So even before you even consider Very one, right? You have to think about all these things because it's so important. But um I guess in the interest of time, I would love to hear from you and our audience would probably love some advice in terms of how to actually um, get um, a long lasting relationship, you know, a fulfilling relationship. What are some of the factors that can help them to um, together work on this? Because I think it's not, like you said, it's not one person, right? There are no. always two people in it and uh, in a romantic relationships. I mean, I know there are different kinds of romantic relationships nowadays and there might be more than two people. And this is a new concept to me to also kind of understand and navigate, but at least there'll be two people. And um, for them to be in this relationship together and to have a long lasting, fulfilling relationship, what are some of the things that they need to look out for? What are some of the tips and some of the most important factors that they should keep in mind? Um, <clears throat> a lot, many actually, but I just, just make it very, uh, uh, I'll make it very simple. Couple of things. Um, one is respect is I've been talking about it. Respect your partner's thoughts, their presence. It's mostly taken granted. Respect their physical body and their inner circle, which is the family of origin and their choice of friends. We all get critical about the family of origin and their choice of friends, which could be very, very insulting. Um, very understated touch, physical touch works wonder. The touch needs to feel good. The touch does not have to be disrespectful. Intimacy needs to be the backbone of the relationship. Uh, I see something as simple, Lou, as maintaining eye contact and smiling. I've, I have heard so often that, you know, he just stopped looking at me and he doesn't smile at me anymore. Non-verbal compliments go a long way than buying something. I know buying is nice and gifting each other is good. But, you know, maintaining an eye contact brings back the trust and smile just brings back the acceptance. Uh, daily ascension, look for something you can compliment. You may, may not want to look fake in complimenting the way the partner looks. Maybe the way they keep home, maybe the way they, you know, wear a combination of dress, maybe what they cooked, maybe anything, you know, compliment can literally be anything. It's an everyday affair. Your partner is happy, you are happy too. It's as simple. A daily supplement, uh, I read somewhere in one of these uh, in one of the articles on happy marriage is to smile. I mean, how simple is it to smile at your partner even when you do not feel? Now, our brain immediately releases happy hormones when we feel happy and hence we try to smile. You know, uh, it's so beautiful to see anybody smiling. Literally, the, the most attractive people in the world are the ones who are actually smiling in their photographs. Smiling at your partner even when we don't feel like is a daily supplement of an ongoing way of appreciation and ongoing fulfilling relationship. Um, again, seen very common, please share the load. It could be family responsibility, it could be finances, it could be the worries. When we share the load, we feel it's done mutually than something that is done alone in the relationship. Um, and lastly, it is so simple, but please give attention. Keeping distractions away, not talking when cooking, not talking when doing a household chore, when not talking when looking at the phone is a huge uh, investment in the relationship than finishing a conversation. So these are some of the things I feel can really, really help. I see couples using humor, uh, you know, to tone down the anger. And uh, I see, uh, you know, a lot of we and I discussion then I taking it, you know, taking the blame, uh, not wanting to always be right, looking at what needs to be, picking a battle, what needs to be won, your point of view or the problem at hand. And uh, so, yeah, these are coming, of course, there are many more, but these are some of the most everyday things I feel that can be added. 
Yeah, absolutely. There's just so many things, right? Because I think uh, one of the things that we we didn't get to mention, but I also learned to be super important would be love languages. Because you, yeah. you mentioned gifts and gifting, you're giving compliments and spending quality time. So, you know, like what would be your top love language, right? That also matters. Like to me, yes. it's quality time, but to another person, it might be physical touch. Yeah. So, yeah, it depends. It really depends. And it's not about what you want to give. It's also about what the other person wants to receive. Yes. So many things. Yeah. <laughs> so many it things is. to think about, you know, re romantic relationships are hard to navigate. And I think one podcast episode is not going to solve all the problems, but um, I think we, we talked a lot about, you know, maintaining and building that those happy relationships and, you know, to, to be happy, you first of all need to understand your happiness, understand how, what makes that person happy and also understand the different boundaries that you need to have in the relationship to stay happy. Sure. Because it's, as I said before, I truly think it doesn't matter if you're saying that you're in a happy relationship, but you're on your own is miserable. It doesn't add yes. up. Yes. And it, yeah. it has to be, it has to be two people in a relationship who are happy yeah. than only looking at my happiness solo. That doesn't work. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's so true. All right. So we have covered most of the theory. You know, I'm sure there's more to talk about, but let's talk about something more practical that our audience can take away. So what is a practice that you use personally, uh, Dr. Mika, to you to cultivate a happy relationship for yourself? I'm pretty sure from what you've told me, I can kind of gauge that you have a happy relationship at the moment. I have. I have. Yeah? Yes. And so how do you how do you make it happen? Uh, well, uh, but we've we've taken years to manage that. My husband's in Merchant Navy, so you know we were uh, we were very young when we got married, and he had to travel, and I was working, I was studying, I had children. Uh, he would be there when, of course, he was on break. But you know the distance, this these are the his his traveling and me being home. You know there was a there was a lot of void on his uh, presence, and today I feel what we've done more practically is that we have one shared routine every day. So Lou, what we do is we walk and run together. We share the home chore responsibility and something very simple. We truly complement each other. It could be, you know, him fixing something or me doing something. It has, so it is not something which came in organically. It is something that we worked on. We realized, oh, compliments really help us. His wanting to help me, me wanting to help him shows that we mutually respect the fact that one thing cannot be done alone. Things that I do every day uh, would be um, one shared routine that uh, for us is, uh, you know, going on a daily walk or a run and sharing the load, uh, household chores or children or uh, yeah, I mean, you know, doing things together, sharing, dividing everyday work than having one being burdened. Uh, besides work, of course, his work is different than mine. And um, complimenting, genuinely complimenting each other to just feel good. You know, this is something that we have cultivated over the years. It didn't come in naturally. So it is something that we do every day. Uh, we, now it's become a pattern, you know. Um, at times, of course, I have to look at something that I have to sincerely compliment. And in the best interest, of course, if I have complimented just like that, it has just gone off because it didn't look genuine at all. So, yeah, I make that effort to compliment him. Even when I tell him, thank you, you know, I was busy or I was angry and you were listening to me. So, yeah. So sharing yeah. the note and doing one activity, which is done mutually. So we do walk or run uh, and there are no distractions and no phones, no children to interrupt. So we talk. Yeah. Yeah. So good to hear. So what are the three good things about this uh, daily practice of uh, doing multiple things together? Because I asked you for one practice, you kind of gave me multiple. So the way I see it is like, this, it's this one big practice where you do daily things together and works yes. for you. Um, so what are, what are the three benefits you've seen uh, this to be in your relationship, doing the daily things together? So I feel uh, when we do daily things together, uh, it's an exclusive time for me and my husband. We give each other time and attention. Uh, and at times, you know, because of this routine, we actually clear the past fight or a disagreement. So what we do is, even you know, the fact we're doing things together in the same space, 
we are clearing the air and then reconnecting. You know, it's not something where that you are pushing off the table not to discuss. We are in the same space. Children are not, are not listening to it, so we don't have people who are, you know, judging us. So it's the excuse of time. We are paying attention to some things. We are clearing out the misunderstandings, and we are again reconnecting. So that's something that I feel uh, works for, you know, for my relationship. Wow, that's so good to hear. It's like so tempting. I'm like, okay, when I'm in a relationship, I'll definitely try that. You know, like have daily practice together, uh, something to do together. Daily routine. That's daily really routine. nice. So I'm sure when you started out doing these uh, daily things together, there must have been a whole heaps of challenges because it's not easy to keep doing things on the daily, right? Even for yourself, yeah. it's hard because yeah, yeah. you might miss a day or two. So I'm pretty sure when you started out doing this, there must have been so many challenges. What were they? So clearly there was a lot of information that was going in. Clearly, you know, I was, I, we both were letting out spaces where we did make a mistake and clearly there were lack of boundaries in the initial years of marriage. Uh, till today, of course, I do make a boundary and at times, you know, it's fluid. But yes, the challenge that I faced of having a daily routine is that there's a lot of information that is going from your side. At times, he does not want to know so much, but because, you know, I, or he, and he not want to know so much, but we will end up giving too much to each other. At times I feel I may not be triggered by what happened, but he gets triggered or what happened to me. So yeah, at times a lot of information can come in the way and missing out the setting boundary, maybe. Wow, super interesting. So how did you overcome those uh, challenges? Because now again, you're doing this on the daily. I still cannot believe you do all those things together daily. We'd, what if, yeah. you know, what if you, what if you goes on a, a business trip? So, so the time when we're together, for example, um, um, so when he, when we're together, so this is something we do together, uh, you know, if he's traveling or I have an early morning. So if I can't do a morning walk, I will probably go out in the evening after dinner. And, uh, before we leave the house, both of us have a list to do. So we divide who can do this, you know, sit sir. It's a teamwork than, oh no, you need to do this because you need to pay the bills and I will cook. No, we don't do that. We manage. Of course, a lot of home uh, household chores is something which is my area because I manage it faster, not that he cannot handle it. And at times, you know, there are things that he has to read and do the bills. He does it because he feels you know, at times I may not be very okay with online transactions because I'll be in a rush to, you know, pay her. But, um, Yes, yeah, so if there are seven, eight things we need to do, like for example, there was a disagreement and we needed to talk about something and we're not together, maybe before sleeping, if he's in another city or another country, before we sleep, we will make a call and try, you know, because that has been on our mind. We try to try to talk about it. As much as we would want to cover a day which can be done mutually, when we're together, we do a lot more. If we are apart, uh, we try to do what's what both best, you know, through online or through a call. Ah, oh, that's so nice to hear. So you find solutions to make it work, even though it's super uh, challenging. Yeah, I really yeah. love that. And yeah. how has this practice impacted your perception in life and your happiness overall? Um, I I feel this. We we have a mutual goal. The first thing, it's not me or him or, you know, my husband above, you know, the whole thing because he's the man of the house. I think there's a mutual goal of making things work. We check on each other, we prioritize, uh, we look at scheduling it if we can't do it right now. So I think it has strengthened over time from a young couple to a middle-aged couple, the commitment that I'm not going to give up. And this commitment I feel is a huge investment for both of us. And to be honest with you, it's my peace of mind. You know, if I don't come back to a grumpy husband or he doesn't come back to an angry wife, I think there's a lot of peace of mind for both of us. So it's an investment and a commitment and an everyday thing, actually. So, yeah, it comes back to peace of mind, the happiness. I'm happy because I know he's happy too. 
Ah, beautiful. And because we're talking about partners and romantic but, relationships, that's so beautiful. Uh, and yeah. thank you. That is our practice section. Um, yeah. Pretty sure we've covered everything. If we have not covered something, uh, please let us know. Um, or, you know, I'm sure the audience might have questions. You can engage with them uh, even after this recording as well. But yeah, if you have anything else that we haven't covered and you think that's super important, please take it away. Yeah, I think uh, I, I think thanks to you and how you navigated the whole, you know, record. I think we've covered pretty much a lot. You gave me so much time to talk about. I mean, there was, you know, managing conflict in a relationship. But I think somewhere or the other, I did talk about things yeah. we can do. And, you know, the the misconceptions or the myths of a happy ever after. Yeah, I have a feeling, I, yeah, I think I have a feeling we covered most of it. Yeah. But we can... We can have our audience ask some questions. Maybe it's very, if it's something very specific, I could bring in my experience to what I can yeah. help with. Or we can have a follow-up conversation, you know, because yes. this topic is yes. such a big one. You know, we can yes. always continue where we left off. And before oh, I, I let you to. go, um, Dr. Mika, I says, thank you so much. It's been so lovely talking to you about this topic, um, but I'm sure thank there's you. so much more that you would like to talk about um, your personal interest, your passion, your work. So this is your open mic. Before we let you go, you can talk thank about you. anything you're passionate about, um, anything that you would like to share with our audience. It doesn't have to be about t today's topic. Uh, it could be about your work. Uh, your side project, uh, something unrelated completely. Uh, so yeah, take it away, whatever you want to talk about. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I'm of course extremely passionate about exercise. I'm, I'm a runner, I do marathons and I started pretty late, you know, in my 30s I started marathon and I feel there's so much of, uh, I, I feel it's like my, you know, uh, running is like my religion literally. So I, I think I started believing a lot in things I can do now than things that I felt I couldn't do because of something as strenuous but as gorgeous as running. So that's something that I'm very passionate about. Um, I want my children to be, you know, to follow it if only if they would want to. I am very passionate about a topic like emotional intelligence. It's a very popular concept. It is something that even children need to learn. Um, we undermine the importance of empathy. You know, we live in a multiculturality and diversity needs to be paid attention to. Um, yeah, so emotional intelligence, of course, is the the, the next facet of how we can be self-aware and manage our emotions to, to get along, to do well with people in our social milieu. And I'm working on that. I've written two research papers, uh, specifically with leadership programs. But yes, emotional intelligence is something which comes, uh, I, I enjoy the topic. It's very nice. It's very human part of uh, growth and evolution, literally. So yes, I'm there. I continue to do my uh, work with my known science, which is anxiety, which of course, you has significantly risen since the pandemic. And I think as long as COVID would be around and we're discussing it, we would also on the sidelines be discussing anxiety, which is now seems somehow this seems to be a very very common reaction to when we step out or you know to anything that changes so I, i'm working on anxiety i'm working on solution focused work i'm working with couple therapy and emotional intelligence wow so many things that you're working on i admire yes. you so much for the work that you're doing wow. and Thank just you. talking to you for an hour it already taught me so much about um, how you would work with people and you know it, it kind of felt like a therapy session in itself um, so <laughs> yeah you, you have no idea how helpful it's been this conversation um, it's it's really nice yeah. to talk to you to get new perspectives and insights and uh, to hear about you know the sort of like the actual stories of people and what happens because you know you don't get to hear about all this obviously if you interact with friends or Very people nice. in your family or your network you would learn uh, certain things but to hear from a from a psychologist uh, to talk about all these things it's just such a joy so thank, thank you so you. much for being here thank you for sharing your insights and as i said we would love to have you back sometime we can probably do a follow-up conversation on the topic because there's so that. much to talk about I love, I would love that. You're very, very good with making everyone very comfortable. I enjoyed my first podcast because you were there with me. I don't know. I would have probably been a little more scared, may have not been as at ease, 
So it actually depends a lot on you. You Thanks. make people I'm glad. comfortable. Yeah. I'm glad. You, you made me very comfortable, really. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'm, I'm so glad that um, it, it went as, smooth as, as smoothly as it did. You've been listening to Sarah Boost, the Happiness Science Insights Podcast, produced by the Happiness Science Labs, a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, and other podcasting apps available on your devices. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at ha.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Lu Ngo. Thanks for tuning in.